but it's a friendly crowd. So. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Talks, a presentation by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm a uh, project director for the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, and I'll call it Quan from now on. Um, our series this year is based on the theme of inspiring stories. And we've been contacting uh, people in institutions, museums, archives, cultural organizations to tell us their inspiring stories. What projects are you working on? What events have you been doing? What research are you conducting in your archives? And to our delight, we've discovered there's so much wonderful research and exhibitions and planning and fundraising going on, um, and sometimes just on a shoestring budget too. Um, and so we're delighted to have people like Rachel Lambie telling us all about the exhibition that is currently on actually, um, and others as well. And our, our series is, um, you can, is available online if you have a Facebook page, you can find us. If you don't have a Facebook page, you can just go to Quan's Facebook page. It's a public site, so you can just go there and watch our presentations online, on Zoom. You can join us as well. And uh, it's, it's a great way to uh, find out the, the activities that are occurring right across Quan's network, right across the province. Our organization is actually a nonprofit organization, and we have as our mission the the protection and preservation of Quebec's history in general, but in particular of Quebec's English-speaking communities spread right across the province. And if you're not a member, you're welcome to become part of our dynamic network. And you can go to our website, qahn.org, to find out more information about us. And there's a membership page. And actually, we have a special membership deal going on right now, 30% off. That's a $20 per, uh, for the for the first year uh, membership. So come on, join us, and find out more about what's going on in the, the network right across Quebec. I'd like to thank our funders for this series, the uh, Canadian Heritage, the Zeller Family Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. And they help us put these, this series on. I have a few instructions for our Zoom audience today. Please keep your cameras turned off. Um, you may have questions at the end and comments, and you can type your questions and comments into the chat box, and our tech director, Glenn Patterson, will relay them to our speaker, uh, Rachel Lambie. Um, and um, it's probably best to, to do it that way. It's easiest. We're trying something new today, so that's the best way to uh, put your comments and questions right into the chat box. And the same thing on Facebook. We'll do our best to relay those comments and questions to Rachel as well. Well, without further delay, I will introduce you to Rachel Lambie. Her presentation is called Finding Home in Brome County. And so Rachel, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, you're very kind. 
so um, good afternoon. My name, as Heather said, is Rachel Lambie, and I'm very honored to be your speaker today. If at any point I am not speaking loud enough or I'm going too fast, just wave your arms and I will slow down or speak up as necessary. Um, I currently work as the curator of the Lack Brum Museum, which is owned and operated by the Brum County Historical Society, and I've been in my post since 2021. Prior to my work here, I've worked for a number of different museum-related jobs, including as a tour guide and food fellow for the Museum of Jewish Montreal, as an education intern and docent at the Montreal Holocaust Museum, and remotely as an interpretive planner for the historic Joy Kagawa House in Vancouver, BC. Um, I have my degree in museum studies from UCAM. My area of expertise was the use of oral history and story, really, within exhibitions, specifically within museum, um, sorry, Holocaust museum ex exhibitions. And since then, I've worked to incorporate stories of the community in which I work into what I produce. Most recently, I curated the temporary exhibition currently on at the museum called, uh, what is it called? I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll get back to you on that. It's on the British home children, um, which is why I was invited to speak to you today. My goodness, sorry about that. <clears throat> I expect that most of you who are here in person are familiar with our museum, but I'll give you a little introduction just the same, so we're all on the same page. Since 1897, the Brougham County Historical Society has been preserving the histories of the region through its archives and museum collections. Today, the Society's Museum operates under the name of the Lackborough Museum to share those stories publicly and to celebrate the incredible heritage of the area historically known as Brougham County. I am extremely lucky to find myself surrounded daily by the local history and often up to my ears in the lore of the area. I get to experience the joys and frustrations of wading through the stories and histories of the families who've lived here for so long. And many of these stories are so, so good and really interest catching. There's never a boring day here. But by far, more than anything else in any other story, the one that's captured my attention from the beginning has been that of the British home children. Since I started at the museum, this is the part of local history that visitors talk about the most. Many come back to the main desk after going through our permanent exhibition and say one of two things. Either, oh, my grandfather or grandmother or great aunt or great uncle or neighbor or best friends, grandmothers, best friend was a home child, or I've never heard this story before, but my goodness, what a story it is. From these comments and questions, I began to realize what an important part of the local fabric this history was, and realizing that I could only go so long without talking about it. I found myself wanting to know more the more I worked here. So the story takes place between 1869 and 1932, when some organizations in the United Kingdom instituted it's easy to talk about it as one program, but it was really a bunch of programs known as Assisted Juvenile Emigration, or the British Home Child Program. In this program, many children between the ages of 4 and 18 who were inst institutionalized in homes across the UK were sent to countries throughout the British Commonwealth with the aim of these children easing the worker strain of the time and primarily getting them off the streets of London and Liverpool. As this was in the aftermath of the Irish famine, when there was a large amount of immigration into the United Kingdom, um, many of the children ended up on the streets, whether or not they were orphaned. These children became known as homeboys, homegirls, or home children collectively, um, because they went from the immigration agency's home for children, we can think of it as a sending home, to a receiving home, which we call here in Canada distributing homes, in one of the countries within the British Empire. <clears throat> Both a home for children, or a sheltering home, depending on the wording used, and a distributing home were similar to orphanages, although the ones in England ended up being extremely short-term stays. The children were then placed with families in rural areas to work as indentured farm laborers or domestic servants. While the children ranged in age from 4 to 18, and we might think that the jobs could have been split up by age, that was usually not the case. It was often separated by gender with boys working as farm laborers and girls working as mother's aides in the house. More than 100,000 of these children were sent to Canada. The receiving homes were often church-run organizations put forth as charities to help the needy, and in particular to help get the children off the streets of London and Liverpool. It was put forth as a project with good intentions by the likes of Annie McPherson, the Salvation Army, 
Dr. Bernardo's Children's Charity, Fagan's, and others. The distributing homes were situated throughout Canada, as far west as the wilds of Manitoba, which at the time was the extreme limits of Canada, and farmers or households needed to submit an application in order to house some of these children. There could be up to seven applications per child. While the system was well-meaning, it didn't always work out the way it had been imagined. Some of the children were living on the streets, <clears throat> but many were from loving homes where their parents were simply unable to provide for a larger family. In fact, only 2% of the home children who were sent were orphans. Upon their arrival in Canada, siblings were often intentionally separated from one another, depending on the home. It is of note that many stories from home children who came through the Knowlton home talk about how Louisa Burt, who was the woman who ran the home, made conscious efforts to keep siblings in similar neighborhoods as much as she could so that people weren't as separated, but that wasn't always the case. While some of the homes were warm and safe, the homes that took in the children, um, many, um, many of the children were treated as cheap labor and sometimes suffered horrific abuse. They often did not fit into the communities where they were fostered and were often treated as lesser than other children because of their background or because they had been brought on to work. The Knowlton Distributing Home opened in 1872, and it was the third receiving home founded by Scottish evangelist Annie McPherson here in Canada. Local lore says that she met with Mrs. Ellen Green, nay Shepherd, Mrs. Foster, the wife of Samuel W. Foster, and Miss Emma G. Barber at a Sunday school gathering at the Tibbetts Hill Schoolhouse, and that the two local women were enthralled with McPherson's project and convinced her to open a home here. She did come to Knowlton, and she was convinced to open a home here, but it occurred in part at the home of the Honorable Christopher Duncan, which is today the site of the Knowlton Golf Course. Either way the story goes, whether it was at the Tibbetts Hill Schoolhouse or uh, at Mr. Duncan's house, uh, by 1872 the Knowlton home had opened and the building still stands today. It's a private residence, but you can see it from Lakeside Rome, uh, Road, especially at this time of year. Uh, if you look at the corner of Hillside and Lakeside, it's the little blue house up on the right. It's harder to see in the summer because of the trees planted along the road. Many of the children who came through the Knowlton home were associated with the Liverpool sheltering home in particular, which is one of the ones that Annie McPherson ran, um, rather than, than the ones in London. The Knowlton home operated until 1915, and in that time, nearly 5,000 children came through its care and worked for local families. The Knowlton home was run in person by Annie McPherson's sister, Louisa Burt, and many of the people in the area know it affectionately as Mrs. Burt's home. She accompanied all of the children who came across um, in her time as caretaker. While some of the children who came through the Knowlton home were settled in and around Brome County, not all of the children who came here came through Mrs. Burt's home, and not all of the children who came through Mrs. Burt's home came to Brome County. The Gibbs home in Sherbrooke, which, is, which was run by the Church of England, today the Anglican Church of Canada, um, also supplied children to the area as well as further away. These two homes, the one in Knowlton and the one in Sherbrooke, are the official ones, but there are others, um, including the Golding Home in Richmond, Melbourne. But because the program was run by different organizations, sometimes churches, sometimes charities, it's a bit of a mystery to me how exactly we can categorize one home as official and another as not since this wasn't one program, but an amalgamation of several. Anyway, it, I can go on about that for a while, but I digress. Um, it's hard to tell why one is official and one is, not, one is not, but we know at least of three. There are so many stories of home children in our area. Volume 7 of the Yesterdays of Brougham County, which was published in 1988, contains an article that includes seven stories of home children in the area, including that of Polly Bowling, who, whose married name was Jones, who was placed with a family in Sweetsburg, which is today part of Cowansville. And at least twice she wrote the story in her own words, rather than being told by her children or her partner, as is the case with others. Our permanent exhibition shares 15 stories, including that of Martha Louise Doughty, whose married name was Royer, of Sutton. And that is also published in the article in the Yesterdays. Our temporary exhibition, which opened in May of 2023, and I really wish I'd written the name down, shares eight stories as paragraphs on the walls, including the story of Ada Partington, as it is lovingly told by her grandson, Jimmy Manson. For those of you familiar with the town of Broom Lake, you might recognize 
two of the stories on our walls, which are told as a family tree. Both Richard Burkham, our mayor, and his wife, Susan, whose Mary, um, maiden name was Roberts, are descended from home children. And we use their families to demonstrate just how widely this story and this history touches the lives of Canadians. We added in recently a touch screen with seven more stories, although most of those are adapted from the article in the yesterdays. The others I will tell you about today, including that of Harry Hartree, who worked for the Johnson family on Brill Road. We set up a sign-in book at the end of the exhibition for visitors to share their family stories too. And I can't tell you the number of people who have come out of one of our exhibitions, whether it's the temporary one or the permanent one, with a, um, a question or a story about a family member that we try to answer as best we can. Most of the stories that survive in Brougham County's collections are passed along by home children or pieced together by their descendants. In some cases, oral histories were collected, and we have stories in the home child's own words. Um, notably, this was a project undertaken by Heritage Sutton in the 1970s, although my understanding is that a similar project was undertaken here as well with Marion Phelps. As is often the case with war veterans and survivors of traumatic events, many home children didn't talk about their experiences. Some felt that once they were in Canada, their stories really began, and so there was no point about talking about anything before that. Even for home children whose experiences in Canada were wonderful and full of love, the trauma of forcibly leaving one's home and family was experienced by every child. So even when we have the stories or the piece together stories, sometimes the details can vary. <clears throat> home Child Canada, which is a charitable organization established in 2012 to help home children and their families get the information they need, whether it's legal issues or trying to find their immigration information or trying to reconnect with their siblings, they do it all. The organization works to bring awareness and understanding of the home children to the world as a whole. They have set up a searchable registry and while it isn't anywhere near complete, it is a good starting place for people looking for information on their family. In fact, when we were working on our temporary exhibition, we often used the British Home Child Registry to confirm or double check information that we'd been given. What we found was that sometimes the details didn't quite match the information provided, perhaps because those details were misremembered by the child in question or because the child wasn't told the correct information at all. There were children who came across whose birthdays don't match, for instance, the birthday that they have here and the birthday that was on their birth certificate, which they never saw, don't match. I lost my place. <laughs> Distributing homes and the sending institutions kept the child's important information uh, including birth records and banking information. When the distributing homes closed, that information was sent back to England and returned to the charitable organizations and not to the children, which meant that as people grew up, they grew up without their birth certificates, which makes things like passports quite difficult. Or writing a will. <laughs> this means that anyone looking for that information, be it the home children themselves, as was the case in the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, or their descendants, has to know where to look in order to find it. That's why Home Child Canada was established, in order to help home children and their descendants find that, per that pertinent information. We have an entire panel on it in our temporary exhibition, and I've printed out copies that are um, by the coffee, <laughs> if, uh, if it's something that is relevant to your life. So that's enough of the general history. I think you get the gist of it. For the rest of our time today, I'd like to share with you some of the stories that we collected for our temporary exhibition. We were fortunate enough to have several keen volunteers who offered to share their, fam their family's story in our exhibition, and we were really fortunate to get some stories from home children who had no familial collection, uh, connections. The three stories that I'm going to tell you this afternoon are some of the latter, which were researched and threaded together by the staff here and by volunteers. These are the stories of Edward Charles Gladding, Harry Hartree, and Frederick Joseph Meads. I will tell you all that I can of these stories, but when it comes to putting together stories like this, I don't have all the details and I probably never will. But I'll tell you what I can. And I'll warn you now, because we had to piece them together and because they didn't have familial collections, not all of these stories are happy ones. Particularly as we had to search for the details, the stories themselves in general don't have happy endings. 
But I want to be clear. Other home children did have happy endings, very happy ones. Many of them found homes in Canada, real homes, and were deeply loved and went on to have children and grandchildren and, and celebrated their lives here as Canadians. So we'll start with Edward Charles Gladding. We received Mr. Gladys' passport during part of the preparation for the opening of our temporary exhibition in May of 2023. Lila Wilson, who is a dedicated volunteer and the descendant of a home child herself, brought in the passport and a photograph of Mr. Gladding that she had received. The passport has Mr. Gladding's story handwritten on the inside, and we pieced together what we could for our display and added in a few extra details when we found them later. Edward Charles Gladding was born in West Ham, Essex, England, on April 5, 1906. He was brought to Canada in July of 1920, having sailed on the Melita from Liverpool. He was brought to the Gibbs home in Sherbrooke, Quebec. And looking at the 1921 census records, we can see Mr. Gladding placed with the Grubb family in East Farnham, although by 1927 he was living with the Strange family farm in Sweetsburg, today part of Cowansville. Although 21 is slightly too old to be formally considered a home child at that time, we can assume that what happened was that he was hired on as a contract laborer uh, while under the age of 18, while he still would have been under that, that home child umbrella, and <clears throat> then they would have renewed the contract once he came of age. This is how we see home children staying with their host families for decades as laborers and farmhands. If it's a good home and they're well treated, why not stay on? Regardless of his age, however, the notion of him being a homeboy would still have been there, even as he started to integrate more fully into the community. After this, most of what we know of him is word of mouth. We know that he died at the age of 23, around 1929. The story, as documented in newspaper articles of the time, goes that he had fallen for the daughter of a neighboring family, who were also likely farmers. Many believed that Edward was not good enough for her and they were not allowed to be together. Edward Charles Gladding was shot at the neighbor's home as he was entering the house, and he was found later in the woodshed. According to the newspaper article, no one was brought to justice for Edward's death. The idea was that he was just a homeboy. There's no way to know for sure, although one could certainly speculate, and I won't do so publicly, but you can ask me afterwards if you're curious as to who I think did it. Edward Gladding is buried in East Farnham, and the passport and photograph were donated to the museum in 2023. Our next story is that of Harry Hartree. We were given his photos in 2023 by Dave Allen, who currently lives in the house where Mr. Hartree worked. So here's what we know. Henry Hartree was known as Harry, and he was born in 1898 in or around Bath, England. In 1901, he was listed as living in North Somerset, England, with the Coombs family, as a visitor, but there is no evidence of his parents' involvement. I'm not exactly sure what that would have meant. Um, it seems to me it would have been like a fostering situation, given that he was about four, perhaps a precursor to the home child story to come. But I can't confidently say more without knowing more about the connection between the Hartrees and the Coombs family. The 1911 UK census has him in England with a group of children in a school. So that would be the, the sheltering home before they sent them overseas. In May of 1911, at the age of 13, he sailed on the Corsican from Liverpool to Canada and then went through the Knowlton distributing home. He settled with the Johnson family in West Bolton and he's noted as being there in both the 1921 and the 1931 censuses. It doesn't seem that he was formally adopted by the Johnsons, as was sometimes the case with home children, although adoption at the time was something of a sketchy business, um, as there didn't need to be any proof that the child had been orphaned or completely given up at all, and the complications of the sending organizations keeping all of the information on the children, you can see how that the details there get a little blurry. We do know that Harry stayed with the Johnsons for his entire life in Canada, nearly 44 years. We... Uh, based on what I've seen, this is not an uncommon thing for homeboys in particular. If it was a good home or a good enough home, the boys would stay on as laborers into their later lives, particularly if they remained unmarried. Census records often listed them as a lodger or a laborer in the family year after year. 
We don't know much about his life after 1931, because the census records are only available up to a certain date. But um, his obituary was published in 1964, and it tells of a happy life with lots of friends who cared about him. No wife, but lots of friends. Newspaper articles mention his dedication to his life with the Anglican Church, and his obituary even names the songs used in his funeral. It talks of how he lived and worked with the Johnsons for 44 years until he died of a long illness. His funeral was at the St. James Anglican Church in Foster, which would have been just down the street from where he lived. And he was buried at the Hill House Cemetery on, Bro on Brill Road. While we don't know much about Mr. Hartree's life, we, other than what is written about him, based on the way these things were written, we can tell that he was loved. He never married, and he didn't have children who carried on his name and shared his story. But still, you read it and you know he was loved. And that's a nice feeling. <clears throat> Our final story is my favorite. And it begins with a box. This box. So every home child received a box similar to this one upon leaving their distribution home. It contained all of their worldly possessions. Um, except the boxes weren't packed by the children and they weren't individualized. So every box was the same. Or every boy's box was the same and every girl's box was the same, I should say. They all contained similar items, um, whether appropriate clothing, a Bible for the boys, a New Testament, and a copy of the Pilgrim's Progress for the girls, a full Bible. I don't know why. Don't ask me. I have a full list here up at the front. Stationery, a hymn book, and that sort of thing. But in spite of the fact that each box was the same, it was the only thing that these children owned when they were settled with the families in Canada. If they moved between host families, this box or their box would come with them. Museums and historical societies across the country that have home child <laughs> stories more than likely have at least one box like this. It was the thing that was kept. So this box was donated to the BCHS, the Brum County Historical Society, in 2004 by Lawrence and Jean McElroy. When I started at the museum, this box was a key part of our home child exhibit, but we had no information on it. The description, which I've copied and put up at the front here as well, said simply, this box probably belonged to a home child. And when I was working on our temporary exhibition, I copied out the description, and I'll, I'll repeat that for you, just so that it sinks in a little bit. This box probably belonged to a home child. How could we tell? Well, there's a description on the box. S. Neves, Gibbs Home, Sherbrooke, Quebec. It doesn't have a hinge on it, so it comes off. So we know that the Gibbs Home was one of the distributing homes for children in Canada, and we can assume that yes, the box probably belonged to a home child. But let's go a little deeper. So the British Home Child Registry was my first stop in looking into this story. It allows the user to search by partial name, so I typed in Meads, comma, F, and I found Frederick Joseph Meads. He was born August 5th, 1896, in London, England. We don't know much about his life prior to 1911, and what we can know is mostly speculation, but records show that he sailed on the RMS Virginian on April 28th, 1911. He arrived in Montreal on May 6th, 1911. As an aside, doesn't that feel fast? It always feels like the transatlantic ship trip should be months, but nope, matter of a couple of weeks. Frederick was sent to the Waifs and Strays Society run Gibbs home in Sherbrooke, Quebec upon his arrival, and he was 14. So from there, we know that he was placed with a family in Foster, just off the Brill Road, where he worked as a farmhand. We know that because he's listed in the 1911 census. This house was owned by Mr. Hillhouse, and he worked there as the house transferred between families, sometimes transferring between Hill houses and sometimes not. He's, he listed this house as his place of work when he enlisted in the Canadian Army. He was in the Medical Corps, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, and he did so in 1917, around the age of 20. Because this was the First World War, we can find his army records entirely online. And we can see that he was sent overseas, listing himself as a farmer in Foster, unmarried, 
and naming his mother, Elizabeth Meads, as his next of kin in England. While we can't be sure that he had any contact with her during his childhood, we can surmise that he did based on his listing her as his next of kin and his knowing his address was the same. At the very, li uh, sorry, at the very least, he knew that she was still alive, and that was not a luxury afforded to all home children. We know that he had at least one brother and that he was not the sole supporter of his mother. So whether that means that his brother was supporting her or that she was working for herself, we can't say for sure, but we know that there was that. At the time, to his knowledge, his father was dead. We have no information about his father. <clears throat> While deployed, he was diagnosed with flat feet and chronic arch pain due to marching. It's likely he never fully recovered from that. He served in France and was discharged during demobilization. After the war, around 1920, we can see that Frederick traveled to England to visit his mother, but he returned in January of 1921 to Foster, to the home where he was working in Foster. The 1921 census lists him as a lodger with the Hill Houses in Foster, working as a laborer in a feed store. By 1931, Frederick was still living at the same address now owned by the Lace family, working as a poultry buyer, and still a single lodger. The fact that he's still living in the same house says something, isn't it? This tells us that the employers that he had here likely treated him well, or at least made it so that he wanted to stay where he was, made it feel like home. I'm struck by the fact that Frederick Meads and Harry Hartree lived with families in the same community. They were about three kilometers from each other. The two boys lived in separate families, um, but they stayed with those homes for so long. It gives the impression that the families in Foster that took in home children treated their home children quite well, although I'll admit that that assumption is based on two examples, but it's a nice thought anyway. It's hard to say what happened to, um, to Frederick after that. He has a headstone in the War Memorial section of the Knowlton Cemetery, showing that he died in 1976. Our research did not find an obituary. The house no longer exists. And to my knowledge, we have no photographs of him. Aside from this box, we have very few traces of Frederick Mead's life. I wish I had more of an ending for you for the story. I wish I could tell you about his happy life and what he did with it. But anything that I put together on that would be pure speculation. It's likely he never married and never had children, since we have few traces of him that exist. We can assume that if he started a family, he would have had a proper obituary and he might have had a proper burial place. But given his own childhood and the trauma that he experienced, it wouldn't have surprised me if he had decided not to have children. He may have stayed in the Foster or Knowlton area and he may have gotten a job working as something other than a laborer or a poultry buyer, but I don't have that information. I don't know. And we won't know. I probably won't have any more information on Frederick Meads until the 1936 census gets released in 2028. <laughs> in the meantime, I invite you to imagine an ending for Mr. Meads. I invite you to imagine a great and wonderful life for him, that he was happy. And if by some chance you do know something of Frederick Joseph Meads who lived in Foster, please tell me. <laughs> My personal curiosities will be satisfied, but it will also mean that we can have an ending to his story that the Historical Society can include in future exhibitions and home child displays. I always struggle with conclusions. How do I end a talk like this? How do I end a story like this? These stories have touched people's lives in enormous ways. Remember when I said that 100,000 children came to Canada through this program? And we've only heard about three of them in great detail today. Much of the work that's been done in the years since the distributing closed, sorry, much of the work that has been done in the years since the distributing homes have closed has been done by Home Child Canada. They've been working officially since 2012, but we know it's actually longer than that to help home children and the people who love them find the answers and find help. Home Child Canada put together that searchable database, the Home Child Registry. And that's still in progress, but it's an incredible resource and in how I found any of the starting information for today's stories. Since most home children have passed by this point, 
Home Child Canada takes on a significant portion of ensuring that this history isn't forgotten and that it is taught in schools, in museums, in community lectures. They were part of the driving force behind establishing British Home Child Day on September 28th. And now one of the things that they are working towards is an apology. Apologies were made by Australia's government in 2009 and initially by England's government in 2010 and many more have followed in the convening years. When we opened our exhibition last May, a representative of the British consulate gave a speech in which she apologized again for Britain's role in the British Home Child Program. And yet, in 2009, then Immigration Minister of Canada, Jason Kenney, said that there was no need for Canada to apologize for abuse and exploitation suffered by thousands of poor children shipped here from Britain starting in the 19th century. Feels like every time communities gear up for a parliamentary apology, there is some kind of statement like that one that precedes it. For instance, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's lack of apology to Japanese Canadians in 1984 for the internments that happened during World War II, followed in 2017 by Justin Trudeau's apology to Japanese Canadians for what happened to them during World War II. Since 2012, British Home Child Canada has been petitioning the federal government to formally apologize to the British home children. I was, part of a, I was part of a group who attended Parliament last November to make similar pleas to our MPs. While a parliamentary motion was passed in 2017 to apologize, a formal apology is yet to come. So few home children are left alive, and those who are are nearing 100 if not past it, that it may seem unnecessary to some. Why should I apologize for something that I didn't do and that wasn't in my lifetime? I benefit from the choices made by the people who came before me. And as a result, I inherit the consequences of those choices, as do you all. As inheritors and benefactors of the decisions made by people who died before we were born, isn't it our responsibility to take responsibility for those consequences? Just a little bit of food for thought. As I mentioned, 100,000 children came to Canada through this program. And that means that somewhere between 10 and 11% of the Canadian population are descendants of British home children. That's one in 10. That's a pretty big number. And if you are one of those one in 10 slash 11, and you don't know where to start looking, your local historical society or museum will be glad to help you as they can. When looking for home children, there are all kinds of details that you need to know, birth names, nicknames, birth dates, the ships they sailed on, the days they arrived, any information that you have from that will be able to help you. When Annie McPherson's distributing homes closed, all of the paperwork for the children was sent to the Bernardo Charities. And as I mentioned before, the resource that's over here in front of the coffee um, has the various information that you might need to help with that. Um, so that's available in person. And there's also a panel in our temporary exhibition that I took a picture of and will be available to the online folk as well. Um, our temporary exhibition is open until April 6th, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, until about 4 o'clock-ish every day. And once it closes, we'll have an online version of it that will be available um, for years to come. Um, and that's what I've got for you today. Thank you so much. <laughs> have some water now. Well, so the question was, um, why were the children separated from their siblings when they got here? It's a great question. Um, the belief was that if you put children in the same area, they were more likely to run away and try and go home. Like they were more likely to find their siblings and leave and go back to England. I have no idea. But that was, that was the mentality, was that if you put children with their siblings in the same place, then they were more likely to try and leave. So if you separated them, you didn't have to worry about that. And from what I've heard of, of Mrs. Burt's home and the way that things were done here and what I've read, um, that doesn't seem to be the case with her. She believed that children should stay together because obviously they'd be happier and, and more likely to, to feel at home, <laughs> I hope. Um, yeah, but that's, that's my understanding of, of why that was the case. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to know, did they ever change their names with the, fam with the families? 
Did they ever change the names with the families yeah, that they, they yeah, families. Uh, adopted? Yeah. If they were formally adopted, they would have changed their names. And in some cases, when they were very, when they lived in homes that were very happy, um, they took on the names of, of people. The example of Ada Partington, her name when she came across was Partington, but she often went by Marsh because that was the family that took her in. Um, to like Just to the end of her life, people would know her as Mrs. Marsh in spite of the fact that she was never formally adopted by the Marsh family. Yeah, so yes. And so the question was, um, just for the, the people on Zoom, did the children ever go to school as part of the program? Um, they were supposed to go to school as, as part of that contract. Um, the hosting families were supposed to send them to school. And I would say in the most, most cases they did. Um, but obviously that didn't always occur. That didn't always happen. Yes. That's a great question. Was there some way that the government or the sending organizations kept an eye on the children? There were people in the community who were um, inspectors. And so they would go from home to home to check on the home children and to check on the conditions. And the uh, intention there was that the inspectors would um, do a good job. And in some cases, <laughs> they did, in fact, um, do a good job. And, and in others, they um, just sort of checked off the box. So they would stop at homes and say, is your home child still here? Great, thanks, bye. Um, rather than actually taking the time to check the conditions of, of the situation. Um, so yes and no, to answer your question. Yes? Why did they stop? Why did they, Why did they stop sending the children over? Why did they stop sending the children over? That's a really good question, too. Um, so in some cases, the labor laws changed. With the house, with the home in Knowlton in particular, um, Mrs. Burt died after a, a long life of, of doing the work here. And in addition, in 1915, there was also a fire. So between the two situations, the, the house here was closed and the children who were connected with it were sent to the United States, or not the United States, Ontario. <laughs> the other one, Ontario. <laughs> and... Um, and then were sent from there. Um, but the program dwindled as the, the influx of immigration lowered in, into the, the 1920s. And um, in addition, the, it was also the, the beginning of the depression. depression. Thank you. <laughs> I've been so focused on this that not all my other information is just disappearing out of my brain. Um, Yes, yeah, so the Great Depression also made some, some complications there, um, but with the change of li child labor laws as well, that, that made a big difference too. Yes, Clyde. Yeah, we have some Zoom questions. Sure. Uh, one person is wondering what the status is of the Gibbs home, and what, she, she thinks there was some talk about being demolished. I wonder if you could talk about that. I don't know a whole lot about the Gibbs home, although our catalog does, um, which was published as part of the, the exhibition, does. Uh, delve into the history of the, the homes in the eastern townships. Um, my understanding is that the building still exists, but I might be wrong. Um, although I know it was associated with a, a church in, um, the, in Sherbrooke. But yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. Ah. Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's the ownership of the children. Mm -hmm. And then we got to know about the place where the children grew. So we got this decision mm -hmm. here. It will not be demolished. Okay. But uh, the winter after this decision, so this would be a few years ago, uh, there was a big, big problem with the system and the, one, the, the system 
group of people. If yeah. you ask to, to do something, you will get the response. Okay. And it's very important. Absolutely. And it's a very nice task. Can you just write that for the people on Zoom? I absolutely can. So the house has not been demolished. It is currently the headquarters for Action Inter Interculturelle in Sherbrooke, although it is not inhabitable um, due to a, a water pipe leakage. Was that it? No, or a problem during the winter of 2022, because it's 2020 or 2021. Yeah. <laughs> Two years ago. Um, and they're working to preserve the building because they recognize the important heritage of the, the former Gibbs home. Um, so it's not currently inhabited by Action Interculturelle, but um, they're working to help preserve the, the building. And there is a hope that there will be work done to do that properly. Okay. Yes. <laughs> We've got some more from Zoom. Sure. Jacob's <clears throat> So um, what I have found in my research is that, in general, the role of religion dictated which sheltering home they went to in England, and then consequently which one they were sent to here in Canada. Um, anyone who was officially Church of England was sent through the Waifs and Stray Society in general, and then sent to Sherbrooke when they were sent to Quebec. Um, but it, it uh, didn't always make a difference to which families they were um, associated in the Eastern Townships. Um, it, for instance, the, the example of Frederick Meads, the first census record that we have of him has him listed as Church of England, and the next one says Methodist, and the following one says Church of England again. So it, it, sometimes it depended on which family you were settled with, and sometimes um, it, was, it was a stronger bond. Um, but in general, it had to do with which home you were sent to in England and then which home you were sent to uh, here. Are there more questions? Yes? On um, your consensus status, um, we know that summaries of our census data is made available within a few years of the, uh, the years taken, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that the detailed material was kept uh, locked up for something near the century. Well, uh, so I don't know why exactly. I imagine it has to do with uh, certain laws about sharing people's personal information. Um, but uh, I think it's 75 years, or maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but the, they make a big deal about when the, the census records that are searchable are, are available, and they're all handwritten from that time, too. So you have to be able to read cursive. <laughs> Sometimes really bad cursive, depending on who was the census taker. Um, but that information is is now available. Um, I think the most recent one was 1931, and then uh, the following one will be will be 1936. Yes. So the the information that you have is mostly like wh who they were living with, where they were living, what they did for a living, the age, whether they were married, and then things like if they read and spoke French, if the census was taken in English. Um, and and whether or not they went to school and and that kind of those kind of details. And that can be accessed online. Yep, for free. Yep, through uh, through the government of Canada website, I believe. Yes. How specifically was the child chosen to come from England? They had to. So um, how children were chosen was depending on um, they, if they were sent to a specific sheltering home. So. Um, in some cases, the children were sent there by, so if, if their mother or their father was still living and the child was sent to the sheltering home, it could be because they were a single parent household and the parent in question was ill and sent their child to this home with the idea that the child was going to come back. Um, but were all and then, the children from that sheltering home? Yes, all of the children from that sheltering home would have been sent. Would the parent have known that they Not always. The child wouldn't always have known that things were sent. This, it, it gets a little murky there because sometimes um, the child was sent and told that their parent had died and the parent was told that their child had died. And so their, that connection was never made again. Um, didn't always happen. Sometimes, as, as we see, um, the connection is still there and you're still able to, to make the, the, the connections happen later in life too. But uh, no, it's complicated. And sometimes only the oldest child was sent. I think we have a question from Zoom. <laughs> Home, have their boxes. Did the Liverpool sheltering home children arrive with boxes as well? 
Yes, there would have been homes. Um, there would have been boxes sent through or from the Knowlton home as well. Um, each home child that received a box that was sent from a distributing home would have received a box. Um, it just happens that the example that we have is from the Gibbs home, but um, every child would have a box, whether or not it was the Knowlton home or the the Sherbrooke home. Yes. Yes. Can you roughly how many unofficial programs there were today? Well, so there were there were three that I know of in the eastern townships. Um, I don't have a number for how many were in Canada. I should look that up, and I will. I can put it in the questions at the end. I, I'm sorry that I don't know that. They've caught me off guard. <laughs> um, I know that Annie McPherson ran three. One which was here and two in Ontario, one in Stratford, and one somewhere else. And um, the problem that I have with it is that there were so many sending organizations that I find it I find it really difficult to keep track of how many homes each one ran. So there were Bernarder's homes, there were Fagan homes, there were Annie McPherson homes, there were Waves and Strays homes, and, and, and Roman Catholic ones as well, which would have dealt more with sending children to French communities here. Um, and it... it uh, I, I lose track. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask that question. Were any of the children sent to uh, French Canadian farmers? Yeah. Is there much documentation on that? So whether uh, children were sent to French Canadian farmers and the documentation on that, in general, that is where the, the religion comes in. So often, um, children who were raised in a, Fran a Roman Catholic situation, even in England, would have been sent to French homes in Quebec, because in historically in Quebec, um, in general, not always, the uh, um, Catholics were French and the Protestants were English, and so you would have uh, English children living completely in French, um, which would have been, and also yeah, Irish uh, an Irish connection there as well. I don't know. I will admit I don't know enough about the Golding Home in Richmond, which may have dealt with Catholic children coming from Ireland. Um, but I, I don't know enough about it. I know that there's a very strong Irish community in Richmond. Um, so there, that may be an exception to my statement, but I, I don't know for sure. Yes? Mm -hmm. Do you remember he was the only one who speaks English? Okay. So that's how I made the contact, the contact to this program. Mm -hmm. and when I talk about the possibility that he had come through uh, as a foreign citizen, mm -hmm. Canadian, he refused to know more details to make mm -hmm. memories. Mm -hmm. so connection yeah um thank you so much for sharing that that story of the the man that you knew um it is definitely a, a difficult thing to 
bridge that subject. Um, and as you mentioned, he was in his late 90s when he passed, and that would be the case for any any home children that might remain. I know that there is at least one in Ontario who is, if he's not 100, he's like very shy of it. Um, but uh, it it was a really difficult thing. Uh, and sometimes I, I imagine that sometimes the home children didn't necessarily know that that was the words that they could use to describe themselves. Um, but it, it would have, it was often a very difficult thing for them to talk about, um, which is why many of them just, just didn't. Um, and that means that, that for us <laughs> today, it's hard to piece together that, that history. Um, but it doesn't make it any less important to do so. Um, and even if, even if this, this man that you knew wasn't necessarily a home child, his story is still a, a poignant one and a really a touching an important uh, important part of his history and and the history of uh, of that particular area in Magog. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. Was there a home on the center road below Kibitz Hill? Kibitz Hill was well. You're asking if there was a distributing home on Center Road? Well, um, not that I'm aware of. The, the homes that I'm aware of in Knowlton are the, the one up here on Lakeside, and just before that one was built, the I think it might have been the old tannery. Is that? It, it's one of the buildings along here that was like the first, first distributing home while they were building this one. Um, so in around 76, 1876, I should say, um, it was sort of like the, the first stop. I'm not aware of any others. But it could have been one of, it might have been one of the ones that isn't on a list. Um, it would surprise me if there was one so close to the Knowlton home. Um, but I, you never, I, I don't know for sure. I'm just guessing to see if there was a building there. Mm -hmm. And there were brick, left down brick. Okay. Everything was sort of, there was a house there. It's entirely possible, yeah. And if, if it wasn't a distributing home, it might have been like an orphanage or it might have been. Um, it might have been a foster home that was that was used in that way too, um, so it's entirely possible. We'll have to look into it. So many more questions. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for this uh, story. The home children's story is heartbreaking and heartwarming, uh, difficult to hear. Um, I know the story that I know was of Frederick Williams, who came when he was 16, and he came to the Miner Farm, which I think is, also, is located in Cowansville, Granby, Granby. And at age eight, 18, he signed up for the, uh, the, the Canadian Forces, went back to... Uh, to fight in World War I, and uh, he died of influenza in 1918 in France. So his life was, you know, tragically cut short, and uh, uh, but left a mother behind. But uh, he left uh, uh, his his um, in his his will. He he left it to the 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 matron of the uh, distributing home. So perhaps lost contact with his mother. So uh, there's so many of these stories that are out there, and it's so important that we know them. I'm, I'm glad to hear that school children are learning them because uh, 30 years ago, no one was really talking about home children. And thanks to individuals and museums and archives that have been putting the stories together, we, we have a, a much clearer picture of what this particular history was all about. And the history of children, children's history, is often overlooked. And uh, we're finding out more about children and what their lives were like through through programs like this, through studies that uh, and exhibitions like Rachel has put together at, at the Brough Museum. So this brings our, our talk to a close, um, and so I would like to thank you very much, Rachel, for a, a wonderful talk, and it was uh, so informative. And um, I'd like to thank you for opening up this beautiful space to us in uh, the Lacbron Museum, the old courthouse. Um, and I'd like to thank Anne-Marie Charouet, the archivist, um, who... Uh, was a little nervous about letting us all in here. Uh, we're sitting really in an artifact. Um, but thank you to you all for not throwing your coffee around. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> that will delight her. Um, and thank you to the volunteers who have helped us as well, uh, Lisa and Elizabeth, 
and also for the tech ex assistance that you gave to us, Rachel, as well. It was very helpful. A lot of the cords and wires and the lights that you see, uh, uh, this one all, all, all went on yesterday. So uh, thank you very much. Um, if you've never been to the Lac Brome Museum, this is a gem in the Eastern Townships. And I encourage you, uh, the, the viewers on Zoom, to come this summer when the museum is open full time um, and come and see the history of this wonderful area. And thank you to the board and uh, the, the staff who allowed us to come today. Um, you can visit the Lac Brome Museum website at lacbromemuseum.ca to find out more about what uh, the activities are and the up and coming exhibitions. And as Rachel said, the Home Child exhibit is still on um, until April, I believe you said, yeah, right? April till, till April. So. We're open. <laughs> Tuesday through Saturdays <laughs> from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock-ish, a little bit later on Saturdays, but yeah, 10 to 4, Tuesday to Saturday until May, and the exhibit's on until April 6th. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, thank you to all of you who joined us today in person in this lovely place, um, and thank you to our Zoom viewers as well, and I hope you'll be able to join us for our next presentation. It's coming up this Thursday, and it'll be only on Zoom. Um, on Thursday, February 8th, we're going to be speaking with Tyson Roseberg, um, and his talk is called Tasting the Past, Food, Memory, and Belonging in Missisquoi County. So that sounds like a delicious talk that's coming up, and you can join us on on Facebook Live as well. And you can find our speaker lineup still to come on Quan's website, qahn.org. And from there, you can also click on the Zoom links to join us by Zoom. Um, and I'd like to just close up today by thanking Glenn Patterson, Quan's digital media director, for running our tech today. Yay, Glenn. <laughs> And you can't see her, but she's in master control, mysterious master control out there, Alison Kirkwood, for running the Zoom platform and keeping us all connected. And again, thank you everyone for this wonderful presentation and day that we've had at the Lac Brome Museum. Thank you. I'm not, I actually retired uh, about four or five years ago and now work for the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. Yeah, as a, as a project director. So, me neither. <laughs>